Welcome to part one of cognition. Uh, we'll be talking about thinking and problem solving. Here we go. So first of all, when we're talking about how we think, we have these things called concepts. Concepts are how we group certain things that we have in our head. So for instance, I have here a picture of chairs. Um, when we think of chairs, all we have this like file cabinet that we open up in our brains and we've got all these different types and sizes and colors and types of chairs that we think. So like we've got the chair like that you'll have at your dinner table, you have like an armchair, rocking chair, a stool's a chair, a wheelchair, uh, a chair that you have out in your deck, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a bench is a chair. And so a concept is just a group, right? The key here is a group of like items, okay? Now kind of breaking that down a little bit further is a thing called prototype. A prototype is our best example of that type of whatever we're talking about. So for instance, for birds, when you think, if I say, what, what do you think of when you think of a bird? Probably what comes to your mind is something that looks a little bit more like this, right? Looks like a robin, a little bit more like. Um, a penguin's probably not the first thing that came to your mind. Well, you know that a penguin fits the title of a bird. It's got two feet, it's got some wings here, but it's, but it's not, the best example of a bird, like a robin's like birdier than a penguin is, if you will, and it helps you uh, see that. So that's a prototype's your best example. All right, and we use, we judge everything as a prototype. Um, so what's our prototype of what a professor looks like in college? What's a prototype of what a, a jock is in school? You know, what, what is it, when we think of these things, what does it look like, right? And then, a lot of times it plays tricks in our minds if something doesn't match that prototype. Now, as you're thinking, we have different strategies that you use. Now, an algorithm is step-by-step -step process. Step-by-step, -step, and you are guaranteed the right answer if you stick with it. So, algorithm is guaranteed step-by-step. -step. So, if I ask you, like, solve or rearrange a certain set of letters to make uh, a word. If you said, okay, so if we had like A, C, D, E, A, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up here, P, S, I don't know if that makes a word, throw a T in there and throw uh, R back here. Okay, if we rearrange this to make some words, if we say, okay, I'm gonna put R first, then I'm gonna put A second, then we're gonna put C, and then we're gonna rearrange these. Then I put R first, A second, C, and then I'll start with E this time. I'll start with D this time. But R first, A second, C third, and I'm gonna put A third this time. And we're just gonna keep trying them all out until we get all these, and you know, add, 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 add the rest of the letters here. But we keep trying them all out until we figure it out. All right, so step by step, you're guaranteed the right answer. This is, algorithm is what a computer uses. It goes step by step to figure something out. A heuristic is a mental, shortcut. We as humans use uh, heuristics all the time. I'm going to talk about a couple of heuristics in the next slide here, but heuristics are mental shortcuts. Um, they allow us to um, to not have to go through the step-by-step -step process and allow us to kind of take in and make judgments about the world around us much more quickly. Because if we had to go through everything algorithmically, then we wouldn't have time to do a whole lot of stuff because our all of our mental power because we know that our brain right is inf is finitely capable of of its consciousness or its memory and we need to uh, can only use a certain amount of the time and so if we devote that to something then we can't devote it to something else right and so a heuristic allows us to save time okay so it's a mental shortcut it's, so for instance um, if I asked you um, what those letters represented you might not put like a an R or an E followed by, I don't know if I had a Y in there. You might not put an E followed by a Y very often because you never see an E followed by a Y in real life or a Y followed by a Z or something like that. Something that you wouldn't see, you say, I don't know, I'm never gonna see this, I'm not even gonna try it. And that would be a, a heuristic. Insight is kind of like that aha moment. So maybe you're trying to answer that problem with the, the rearranging the letters you try doing it step by step, or first of all, you probably try to do a shortcut, and that doesn't work. Then you try to do, then you try to do it step by step, and that's not working. Then sometimes you go, "Oh, that's it," and you have this aha moment. So insight's kind of this, just this aha moment that we have when we're trying to solve a problem. 
Um, when you watch like detective shows or Sherlock Holmes or like a lawyer show, often you'll see the main character just go, "I've got it," and you know, they'll walk away, and then and all the people in the room are left like, "What's he got?" And they follow him to the next room. That's that aha moment. That's called insight, right? That just happens like spontaneously, and all of a sudden it's kind of this cool magical moment where everything just comes together in our head, and we just get it. It's called insight. Um, okay, so now some obstacles to problem solving. First thing we have here is confirmation bias. We've talked about this before, but confirmation bias is where we tend to look for information that supports an idea that we already have. So for instance, um, if I'm looking, uh, we do this a lot with politics, right? Um, you have a political idea and whether you did like or dislike the president, you tend to see things that support your like or support your dislike of the president and you ignore things that might go against that might say oh you know what he's not such a bad idea or you know what he's not such a or he's not as good as i thought he was we tend to just focus on the things that support us uh oftentimes with religion same thing things that we're passionate about a lot of times we use confirmation bias so this is a problem with problem solving um fixation there's two types fixation is when we're um not able to um not able to look at something completely or all around. We're fixated with certain events. So it's a type of fixation is called a mental set. Um, a perceptual set, which we had back in sensation and perception. A perceptual set is how we perceive the world around us. A mental set is how we think about the world around us. So we have this mental set. So if I see, if you know, uh, if I think that girls can only do a certain job. Right. If I if I perceive that a girl can't do a particular job, I say it's just you know as a, an example, a girl is not going to. I think that a girl can't be a a miner, right? A mining for coal. Okay. So that my my percept my mental set is when I say, okay, tell me about what a miner looks like, or what would you say is as this miner in this next room? Probably what's not going to come into your mind is a girl, because your mental set, your way of thinking about that particular idea does not include a girl. Even though a girl is perfectly capable of mining, can do it just the same, we don't think of it. Our mental set doesn't allow us to think of that. And that uh, hurts us sometimes when we're trying to solve problems. Uh, likewise, a, an idea called functional fixedness. This is where we tend to only look at something uh, for what we commonly see it used for. So for instance, this is a very common uh, example that you've probably had in class. Um, it's called the candle matchbox problem, I think, is what it's usually referred to as. And it says, you get these uh, supplies, how can you make that candle s stick on the wall and uh, and light it, right? And so we see this candle, we see this tax, and you know, everybody's scratching their head, I don't know how to do it. Uh, of course, the correct answer is, right, you take the tax out of the box, you tack the, you know, the box uh, up to the wall, you put the candle, you sit it inside the box, and then you light it, right? And so we have to kind of think outside the box for that, as it were, you know, no pun intended. But before we got to that idea, we probably had functional fix in this because we never thought of this box that held the tax as a holder for the candle. And so we had this functional fix in this. Um, so yeah, there you go. Another example of like confirmation bias would be like uh, in Iraq, we had the weapons of mass destruction. Um, that's why we went in and invaded Iraq. And so all these things, you know, even after it was proven that it wasn't true, that they didn't have weapons of mass destruction or we couldn't find any at least, we kept looking for reasons to, uh, that oh, they could have had it. Yeah, they could have had it. Um, okay, finally, um, here's some more heuristics that I promised. First of all, we have a, what's called a representative heuristic. Remember, heuristics are mental shortcuts. Um, representative heuristic is how well does this represent my, basically how does it represent something that kind of like your mental set? How does this represent what I already know about? Um, so we take these shortcuts. So if I asked you, for instance, um, if I asked you what, which is more likely to be, who, who's, who has more uh, sh short people that have a mustache and glasses and are very thin. And I asked you, is it going to be more of a truck driver or more of a college professor? And you would probably say, probably the college professor, right? Because we have this picture, this mental set of our images, this truck driver, these big burly guys probably, right? And so 
uh, what comes in our head, a representative heuristic, is we represent, we compare it against something that we already know, and we take that shortcut and we go, okay, that, if I really ask you, you know, we break this thing down, how many truck drivers are there in the world? Probably, in, or in the United States, you know, we've got uh, tens of thousands of them, right? How many uh, college professors? Much less than that, right? We have more truck drivers than we have college professors, uh, especially maybe if I even met a professor of, of like, uh, Latin or something like that. And... Um, in reality, right, even if it was like one in 10 of the truck drivers, there would still be way more truck drivers that would be short and skinny with glasses and a mustache than um, professors because there's just more of them, right? But we don't think that way because we just compare it against our preconceived ideas. Additionally, would be the availability heuristic. Availability heuristic is we take these shortcuts of just information that, we're, that we know about, that we have available to us. So maybe you've never seen something or you don't, uh, under, you don't know something very well. We use availability heuristic a lot. Uh, this kind of happens with culturally, right? If we see like the terrorist attacks, right? So the terrorist attacks we saw, um, some people from the Middle East attacked the Twin Towers, right? Terrorist attack. And maybe we, people who don't have a lot of contact with people from the Middle East um, tend to look at those anybody who's from the Middle East as a potential terrorist, um, even though, because our only contact or only reference is that time that we've seen that they were a terrorist, right? Even though there's millions and millions and millions of people from the Middle East who are not terrorists, and so we, you might have this availability heuristic and only compare it against something that you know. So that's the only I, that's the only example that you have available to you. So availability heuristic. Last two things: overconfidence. We've talked about this before. We tend to be overconfident about uh, our decisions all the time. We are extremely overconfident. Um, we something called there's a, an idea called the better than average effect. We all think that we're better than average, right? Well, no, we can't all be better than average, right? That would defeat the definition of the word average. But we tend to think that way. We have this overconfidence with our, and that's a as a problem. We're forming judgments and um, decisions. And finally, this idea of framing. How we frame something can affect our decisions big time. When we talk about social psychology and persuasion, this comes into big time. I mean, look at this. If I actually look at this, you think, oh man, this guy's getting the crap beat out of them. This is not fair. This is a horrible image of the United States soldiers. If I just showed you this one, you would think, oh, look, we're, you know, we're the compassionate. We love each other, you know, and then I give you the real whole picture and you say, oh, well, this is a little bit more um, uh, complicated than one or the other. So how we framed the picture can determine how we feel about it. Another example of framing would be um, if I told you that a drug has a 95 per, 90, let's say 95% success rate of, of working, but it has a 5%, okay, it has a 5%, 95% success rate of working, if not, you're going to die, right? Or if I told you this is going to kill 5 out of 100 people, right? If I told you it's going to kill 5 out of 100, most people are going to be a lot more um, hesitant to take that drug than if I said it had a 95% success rate. They're both the same information. It's just how I framed it was different. How I present it. How it's presented to you is kind of how it's framed. All right, so that's uh, the first part of cognition, and we'll see you next time.